first talk this afternoon is by Noam Elkins. Okay, thank you. Thanks to <coughs> the organizers for inviting me back to this beautiful place and also for arranging the weather so that I can more or less walk from Corbett here wearing uh, nothing but this in the middle of January. Uh, this is the shirt that actually I got for giving a talk on somewhat the same uh, topic at a, a graduate student conference in Yukon, meaning not the one here in Canada, but University of Connecticut. So I guess appropriate here. Uh, thanks in particular for inviting me to a workshop on uh, geometry and physics when I'm certainly not a physicist and I'm not really a geometer either, at least not the sense of algebraic geometry. I do number theory. Sometimes I, as I said, what I do is arithmetic geometry. But uh, K3 surfaces and elliptic vibrations of K3s and of other varieties uh, do show up naturally in number theory as well. And since I've been given a 45 or so minute slot, uh, I will allow myself to start <coughs> by giving a bunch of examples of why number theorists care about K3s and therefore of why, of how some of the ideas that I hear here in other contexts, uh, you know, what they sound like to a number theorist, and uh, then give the steps in the construction of what I think is an elliptically fibered, a family of elliptically fibered Calabi Yaws over P2 that has rank 10, which I'm told is larger than it's been in the uh, current record, which I think stands at eight, at least conjecturally. Uh, so the overview of this first part is that, well, one way of saying it is there are all of, there are these, you know, the mathematical universe has some structures that are so fundamental and so inevitable that you're bound to run into them no matter what you do in mathematics or even in subjects like physics that, use, that speak mathematics. So, you know, calculus was basically invented by Newton to do physics. And likewise, you know, Fourier analysis and, you know, rational functions were not invented by physicists, but of course they show up all the way here as well. And at a somewhat higher level, K3 surfaces and elliptic vibrations are also a somewhat central, you know, central enough topic that we're not too surprised in some sense that, you know, when you need something mathematical, sometimes you run into those. For elliptic integrals, by the way, I guess physicists know about the, this uh, harmonic motion that's not quite simple, but of an actual uh, pendulum. So yet another example of elliptic functions <coughs> coming up in physics. Uh, so one difference between what happens in physics and in number theory is that physicists mostly walk over the real complex numbers. I think it's safe to say that number theorists care about real and complex numbers too because Anything that's going to happen in the rationals or in some other number field will automatically happen in the complex numbers. But we also care about these structures over, other, over much smaller fields like the rational numbers or finite extensions or even finite fields such as the integers mod p. Uh, now, often you can go to a number theory talk and uh, not see many actual numbers except in you know, exponents and the uh, uh, what do you call it, Comalgi indices and the like, uh, this is not going to be that kind of number theory talk, so I will actually give some explicit equations. Um, and uh, let's see, so the very first place that we run the K3s is one of the oldest parts of number theory, solving the Fantin equations. By which I mean, more or less the same thing that the Euphantus did, equa or polynomial equations to be solved in rationals. And we now know more or less that, uh, you know, if you give me a, a bunch of polynomials, that's some algebraic variety. And to understand the rational points, so solutions of the equation are rational points, the variety, so that's why we talk about arithmetic geometry. We need to understand the algebraic geometry of the variety, but with coefficients in rational numbers so that we can actually, you know, over the rational numbers, so we can actually talk about what the rational points look like. And these, as we understand quite well by now, first with by dimension, there is a mention zero, which I didn't bother even putting up here, that seems like the irrationality of the square root of two. And there is a mention one, where we have when either a genus zero curve, which is either 
rational in which case it's very easy to describe all the points, or it's obstructed. It's like x squared plus y squared equals minus 1, in which case there are no rational points, and it's easy to detect the local global principle over number of fields. And then there's genus 1, which is elliptic, or more generally genus 1 curves, and curves of general type, which have genus bigger than 2 and have only finitely many rational points. And the elliptic curves are by far the richest structure that we have, and there are still open questions about them, although by now we understand them quite well. And so our next step is what happens in dimension 2. And again, K3s are the next step in complexity that you're going to get past rational surfaces, and rational surfaces are almost, in some sense, very easy. There are some subtleties here over number fields, like you know, a cubic surface is rational. If you think about over C, it might not be rational over Q, but might still have lots of points, et cetera, et cetera. But at least in overall sense, K3s occupy pretty much the same space in dimension 2 that elliptic curves do in dimension 1. It's a bit surprising, maybe, if you know about elliptic curves in a group law that you see elliptic, you don't see the mo what seems like the most natural analog, which is uh, abelian surfaces. It's very rare for, in a, for a, uh, a naturally defined equation to, to uh, give rise to an abelian surface or any abelian variety bigger than, bigger than one. Uh, I don't remember running into a single natural example, except for somehow concocted to, <laughs> to uh, you know, more or less make it clear after the fact that it has to be this. So uh, these include you know, simple equations, equations that come from geometric constructions, equations that arise when you try to find nice algebraic identities. You know, for instance, if you want to give a quartic polynomial to a calculus class whose derivatives all have integer solutions, uh, so they can locate the uh, inflection points and relative absolute max, I mean, local maxima and minima, etc. And often these overlap, again, Nice mathematical structures tend to show up in many different places. Uh, what's more, I believe I don't have to say too much about what rho is, the Picard number, it's at most 20 for a K3 surface, and often things that you run into in practice actually attain or at least come close to that. And they're more or less forced to because there's lots of symmetry which is acting on the neurons of very group, or because there's lots and lots of obvious divisors from points at infinity or singularities, etc. And you're more or less forced to have so many divisors that they, all, they attain or nearly attain the maximum of 20. So some examples go, well, I don't remember if there's actually one in the Ophantos, but certainly Euler already did quite a few non-trivial things in this as he did in many areas. Uh, so I give the example of the rational brick or the Euler brick problem. That's the one where you ask for a box with its sides rational and all of its face diagonals rational, or equivalently integral by scaling away uh, what you call it, uh, common denominators. Uh, also, he found solutions for this Diophanian equation for all val non-zero values of A. Of course, zero values you don't, we don't need order to solve. We don't exactly know how he did that yet, but that's a separate talk. Um, and he, he found the first solutions for uh, this. In fact, in each one of these cases, he found whole families of solutions, so geometrically rational curves on the K3 surface. So <coughs> this one is the intersection of three quadrics in P5. These two are quartic surfaces. Uh, as I mentioned, next time when I say quartic surface, I'm allowing some ADE-type singularities that you have to resolve to get the actual K3. Uh, so further examples, what I drew here, uh, equilateral triangles with rational sides and the point that has rational distances from all of them. Oh, uh, excuse me, that's the, next, that's the final example. No, it's not even here yet. Where is it? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, did I mention this already? No, that's on the next page. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's right here. Uh, so first of all, triangles with rational sides and medians. That's another three-quadric three surface. Uh, the Fermat point question, so if you look at the formula for the volume of a uh, tetrahedron, you substitute these six <coughs> distances. Ah, sorry, it should be consistent. 
uh, you get some determinant, you can divide through by x naught squared, and you wind up with, uh, with this quartic, which remarkably is symmetric under all four variables. So the condition is the same if any one of these other uh, variables, x1, x2, x3, is the side of the triangle. Uh, some of us have a hard time forgetting these kinds of uh, contest mathematics. You rotate this whole part of this picture 60 degrees, and you get a, a new crater triangle and the point that sides x0, x1, x3 from it. Anyway, so I'm not doing algebraic If I'm not doing algebraic geometry, at least they do like Euclidean geometry. Uh, and finally, speaking of which, pairs of Pythagorean triangles that have the same area. So again, the quartic and two, a quartic and two variables equals the quartic and the other two. And again, singularity is to be resolved, but okay. So moving on to more advanced looking mathematics, uh, you can ask for, let's say, sextics of this special form with no x fifth, x fourth, x cubed term that split completely. So in terms of the roots, you're asking that the first three power moments vanish. So that's the other kind of complete intersection that we're familiar with, cubic and quartic and, and quadric in P4. Uh, it also, if you remember, I said we're interested in solutions mod P. If you count the solutions, you end up with some moment of this kind of exponential sum with a cubic uh, with a cubic exponent. Likewise, if you look at split quintics, which have no x or x to the fourth term, you end up with this nice quartic surface. Uh, does it look like quartic surface? Uh, this makes it a, uh, a P3, and you clear out common factors, and you get a sum of five monomials, quartic monomials. And again, this is some quint, some, in this case, fifth degree moment of a cross-term sum if you count solutions mod P. And finally, there are at least these four groups, or, well, there are four groups for which they can occur as the uh, uh, torsion group of an elliptic curve. And if you look at the general elliptic curve with that structure, <coughs> okay, so the moduli space, it's a modular curve, x1 of 7, x1 of 8, whatever you want to call that, and x of 4, there is a universal elliptic curve over them. As a surface, that's a K3 surface. And in fact, it turns out to be one of maximal rank. And if you're fixing an elliptic curve and you want to look for quadratic twists, again, this might look like exactly the same curve to you, but for number theory, it's a difference because of this factor of C. We can't just take the square root of it. And we want two different points in that curve. That's parameterized by some K3 surface. In fact, it's a cumor of the square of EVO. So for generic E0, it has to be card number 19. For C on curve, it's 20. OK. So uh, that's where K3 surfaces and trying to find rational points in them show up sort of in, you know, adjuvantine equations that we're interested in one form or another. They also give rise to a rich uh, family of moduli problems. And the point is that there is a, a nice Torelli theorem that says basically any reasonable Hodge structure that's consistent to the Hodge diamond can arise. <coughs> and that means that uh, if you specify some constraints, like, you know, I want a divisor of degree four, of self intersection 4 and one of self intersection minus 2, that should be orthogonal to each other, uh, that gives you some, that, that, that gives you some uh, linear conditions on, these, on this Hodge structure, and you get some arithmetic quotient that parameterizes all K3s with that structure. So the way it's usually described is you start with some, uh, what, what's the word, hyperbolic lattice L, so it has one positive and rho minus one negative directions. It has to be even, so the inner product of anything with itself is an even number. It has to embed primitively in the famous K3 lattice of signature 319, which is often written like this. Uh, this minus one means I want to make it negative definite, so multiply the norms are minus one. Uh, primitive means it's a slice, so there are no extra vectors that you get by dividing vectors in your lattice by some constant that are also in the lattice on top. At any rate, uh, once you fix such a lattice, it, there is a moduli space, K sub L, that classifies K3s with an embedding of your chosen lattice into its neuron severity group consistent with intersection pairing. Uh, and 
it's the union each, so it can have more than one component to do. In any case I'll show today, there's only one component, which is the usual situation. Uh, one throw is at least, one throw is less than 20. Uh, each, each component is of dimension 20 minus rho, and each time you have an inclusion of lattices, you get an inclusion of these modular spaces. Because if you have a lattice that uh, contain, contain an L, L prime contain an L, anytime you have something with an L structure, you automatically have an L prime structure. And so you have this beautiful family of moduli spaces containing other moduli spaces. And because they are arithmetic quotients, when they are of small enough dimension, they have to be the arithmetic quotients that we know from number theory. And when they are a bit larger, they still include these quotients. So for example, when rho equals 19, it's a one-dimensional arithmetic quotient. It has to be a modular curve. It could be a classical modular curve. It could be Shimura. But it's a modular curve. And the modular threefold of all principal of being surfaces uh, occurs, as was uh, alluded to at least in uh, Professor Kuwada's talk this morning. And therefore, natural subspaces like the Humbert surfaces, Humbert, how does one say that? Uh, that parameterize principally polarized surfaces with real multiplication, those occur as surfaces in that threefold. And a remarkable thing is that it can be easier to, to access, by which I mean get equations for these surfaces as moduli of K3s than it is to find them as moduli of, let's say, a billion varieties with an actual multiplication by square root of seven, let's say. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> what am I trying to get at here? Um, okay, I give one of the explanations. Um, ah, remember there is this uh, Torelli theorem that I was alluding to in the previous slide? That's very transcendental. It does not give you explicit equations. That's the kind of conundrum that we are we see in some, in some other famous cases in number theory, like L functions, zeta functions, where you have some formulas that are given by transcendental techniques that end up having to actually be things like rational numbers or logarithms of rational numbers. This happens here also. These are some algebraic varieties that have to be defined at least over some number field, but they are constructed for us as you know, some complex manifolds. And it can be something of a challenge to actually exhibit them by polynomial equations. But that's the kind of thing that some crazy number theorists like myself like doing. And it turns out we have a much easier time doing this in, a K, in the K3 setting than where the problems came from originally. And one, my, the explanation I give for this is, let's say rho equals 19, that means you have to start from you know, some K3 surface, let's say an elliptic vibration unrestricted, so there's seven, 18 parameters and then choose one of these parameters at a time by sticking in more and more uh, divisors. So you can either stick in a singular fiber or a section. Each time you do that, you're climbing up this uh, tower of moduli spaces, and you have to climb up, let's say, 17 times. The difficulty, oh, so these, these moduli spaces get more and more complicated, basically as the discriminant of the last increases. But by already parameterizing uh, the lattice of the surface for discriminant L prime, so for L prime, well, uh, you've gone most of the way towards parameterizing those for L, at least if the discriminants are roughly as large. So if I have something huge of discriminant, let's say 1,000, instead of trying to put all of that in at once, put in, you know, a few, uh, a few bad fibers to get the discriminant up to 8, and put it in other ones to get it up to 16, and so and put in some sections, and you gradually get up to 1,000, and each step is manageable. And so I can do that. I've done that for a few Shimura curves. I haven't started to do that uh, systematically yet because, well, that's a nice project for a graduate student to learn this, uh, th this kind of technology. Uh, I did have a wonderful graduate student in Abhinav Kumar who worked with me on the corresponding uh, results for Humber services, and we got up to about discriminant 100 there. Uh, these also, with some additional work, give you the Hilbert surface that actually describes a, a BN surface with an action of OD, right? So the Humbert surface, I mentioned, let's say, square root of seven. Once you give me the surface, I can't tell which is square root of seven, which is minus the square root of seven. 
they both act just, they, they look just the same. If you specify one of them, you're taking a quadratic extension of your moduli space. But we can tell which extension it is because it's going to be ramified along one of these modular curves. And we can find those also with K3 surfaces. And so that lets us, with some additional fiddling, find these, uh, these Hilbert surfaces. And not surprisingly, you have a family of surfaces which start out simple and get more and more complicated. Somewhere along the way, those surfaces themselves will be K3. There's about six of these examples. Uh, for example, the first one of these occurs when discriminant 21, and it happens to have, again, there's lots of, there's some symmetry and lots of quote unquote trivial uh, divisors, and it turns out there's enough to make rho equals 20. Discriminant is rather large, but it factors nicely. And all of these, if I remember right, have, have rho 20, except there's one that has rho equals 19. The way we show that the row is not 20, by the way, is by counting points modulo prime. So that's another thing you can do with you know, number theoretic techniques. <coughs> OK. And my final kind of application, by the way, each time I move from like Roman 1 to Roman 2 to Roman 3, that might be a good time to ask questions if there are questions. Um, OK. So this has to do with the infantile record hunting. So this goes back at least 100 years to uh, Mordell's famous theorem, which by now is almost 100 years old, that if you have an elliptic curve over Q, it has a group structure. That, strangely enough, was not really known in anything like the forms we know it now and before Mordell. Mordell found there was a group structure and showed over Q, it's finally generated. The group is called the mordell vey group because Vey generalizes the theorem with much the same proof, but you have to take care of a few more details for number of fields, and now we know there's analogous things for elliptic vibrations in the algebraic geometry setting. Uh, so finally generate means it's a direct sum of the torsion group, which is finite, and some finite rank free abelian group. And the, the, the composition, the, the, the finite rank part is not canonical in general, but the, the rank is. So there are two invariants, there's a torsion size, there's a torsion group, in fact, and there is a rank. And the torsion groups over Q are fully classified by Mazur, by now also about 30 years ago, and they're exactly those for which the modular curve, I mentioned that earlier, for the group of, cyclic group order 7 and 8, etc., for which these modular curves are rational. You might notice that the 4 times 4 example doesn't show up here, that's because that modular curve is rational, and it's a very nice one, it's, it's P1 with the octahedral symmetries, but it's only defined over Q or join I. You cannot have, you can see just from the real locus, you cannot have full four, level four structure for an elliptic curve over Q. So over Q, you have cyclic of order one up to 10, not 11, that's an elliptic curve, and it has no, non, it, it has no rational points coming from actual elliptic curves, or 12, and then you can have full level two with also a four torsion, six or eight torsion. And each arise infinitely often because it's a rational parametrization. So the torsion groups are understood, and for each one of them, you can ask, okay, what are possible ranks? So, is that constraint on the torsion group true even for elliptic vibrations over an arbitrary base? Um, this is over Q. Over an arbitrary base, it cannot be true because, uh, in general, for any group, you have. You know, so if, if the group is cyclic, you have an a modular curve x1 of n, and in general it's going to be like x1 of what well, I call x1 of m comma n for having z mod m across z mod n. And if you have an elliptic vibration E over some base, and that elliptic vibration has distortion structure, that gives you a map from the base to that modular curve. Uh, namely, go, given each, po each point in the base, look at the elliptic curve, that's some elliptic curve with distortion structure, so it comes from a point here. Um, and that map can't be constant, unless you're interested in constant vibrations. So, for example, as soon as this curve is not rational, you're not going to be able to map Pn into it, except by constant maps. So, uh, that theorem is almost true, except that you have to add in these modular curves that occur only over higher number of fields, 
And those are the cases 4, 4, which I mentioned already, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, and 3, 6. And 11, right? No, 11 is still an elliptic orb. There are several elliptic orbs, 11, 14, and 15 are elliptic, as well as Think there's one, there, there is one part like this. So if that, I, what's the right word? If the Albanese variety is trivial, then you cannot go to a in curve of genus more than zero. If it is, well, you have to tell me what kind of base you're interested in. But you would say if you add in those things, you've exhausted the set of torsion groups even over, say, Pn. Yeah. That, actually, in the Calabi case, you've exhausted it because you get H1 of O on Calabi if you have a higher genus. We don't allow one quantum on the other half. Okay, fine. So, okay, right. Yeah. This is much easier than Mather's theorem because, you know, these, each one of these curves, even though it has positive genes, it could have an isolated rational point. So, you know, Mather's theorem is much harder. The fact that I just described now could certainly have been done, you know, a few decades before Mather and was surely known. It's still an open question over Q, what ranks are possible? In particular, is the rank unbounded, even if you don't specify the torsion group? Usually, the bigger the torsion group, the harder the question is. I mean, the, the, the lower the ranks are. And as long as it's open, and it's a matter of controversy, I think opinion in the number three of the community has shifted at least one full cycle, whether we think it's going to be bounded or unbounded or bounded. I think now it's more or less uh, the consensus such as it is, it's probably bounded. But I'm still, you know, on the, on the side that says, I don't think we have enough real information. <laughs> there are various heuristics, some of which suggest yes, some of which suggest no. And it's almost like, well, okay, I'm not going to go there with, with, when I'm being recorded. But uh, <laughs> it's an open question. And so one thing we do is we get data. You know, how high a rank can we find? And there's a standard strategy for this kind of question. Find a parameterized family that already has some moderately large rank and look for specialization. What does that mean? You have a family of elliptic curves over some base. That's an elliptic vibration. Having some large generic rank means you have some you know, reasonably large more their vague group of sections. And then within that family, you look further. And again, algebraic geometry gets very fast, more complicated as you go past, as the dimensions increase. The first dimension, which you have any hole here, is two, the one dimension base and elliptic curves. So look for surfaces with elliptic vibrations. And well, rational surfaces can have elliptic vibrations, and the rank is a, it can get as large as eight. That sort of qualifies as marginally large, and for a while, all of the record elliptic curves are coming from that. And we'll have a lot more to say about that uh, in, in a few uh, slides. But to get past eight, you have to go past rational elliptic curves, the rational elliptic surfaces, and the first place to go is K3s. And suppose we have K3s with trivial torsion, which is sort of like the generic version of the question. Uh, well, we've heard already by basically the Tate-Shiota theorem, since rho is at most 20, the model of rank can be at most 18. And that can be attained over the complex numbers. There are many, many ways of doing this. I think we heard, we more or less heard a few in the, this morning. I chose another example here. Take a 12 degree polynomial whose roots are, have a consecutive symmetry. Look at y squared equals x cubed plus that. It's one of these cases where lots of symmetry almost forces you to have large, more than large uh, neurons severe rank. It's rank 20. There are no reducible fibers. And so all of that goes into the rank. Uh, I should have mentioned here that my former student, Evgeny uh, Zeitman, actually figured out explicit generators and thus figured out the lattice, etc. But it turns out you cannot attain rank 18 for a K3 surface over Q if you require also that all of the sections have rational coefficients, which you must to play this game. The reason is that uh, if you're going to have that, you're going to have your neuron severity lattice, right? So there is a 
there is a hyperbolic, so-called hyperbolic plane generated by the zero section in the fiber, and that's an analysis of unit dis uh, discriminant. So there are also very group factors as u directs some, some negative definite lattice by the index theorem, so you make it positive definite by multiplying norms by minus one. That's an even lattice, and it cannot have any vectors of norm two, because once you're past the rational elliptic case, any vector of norm two in this lattice has to come from a reducible fiber. And as soon as you have reducible fibers, the rank drops below 80. Where there is, okay, I'm sorry, I should have put this in here. Uh, this is a theorem that was proven by Schutt. Um, I found a separate proof, but I haven't published it yet. Uh, proven by Schutt, uh, uh, Matthias Schutt, that uh, the discriminant has to be one of the 13 Euler Hegner numbers, starting from three and getting as large as 163, for which the corresponding quadratic order, which shows here as the, the transcendental lattice, has unique factorization. And 163 is impressively large for some purposes. You've probably seen this factoid about e to the power root pi, pi times root 163, which was many of our first introductions to complex multiplications, but it's not large enough for this purpose. There is no 18-dimensional lattice of discriminant only 163 for which the minimal norm is 4. If there were, you'd be able to enclose unit balls around it and make a, a, a dense packing of 18-dimensional space with spheres that would break the known record. Of course, well, that, that could be, you could try to break the known record, but no, I can prove directly that there cannot be one of rank 18, and by now, I've listed all of the possible such lattices, and none of them even attains rank bigger than 11. 11 is nice, it's bigger than 8, but there are already examples known that have rank more than 11 over Q. Fortunately, with a lot of effort, we are able to do, get 17 the other way. So rank 19, uh, Picard number 19, but uh, so possibly when they're uh, 17, but with a large enough discriminant so that it's possible to have rank 17 lattice with no minimal vector of norm, uh, with no vector of norm two. The smallest example I was able to find for this, there might be a smaller one, but it's a lot of work to do with any one of them. The discriminant has to be as large as 948. So it's a rather complicated Shimura curve. It happens to have genus only two, and it has one, uh, one is sporadic orbit of rational points. Sporadic meaning it does not see him. If it's a CM point, then it's really a, a model of some K3 surface of rank 20, and I can't use it. But I found one such, and eventually found a uh, specialization that has rank 28. That was back in 2006. There are several other cases of rank 25, 26, 27. And so far, all of the examples known that have rank bigger than 24, which was a previous record, come from this one family. Uh, and these record curves also, when you figure out that the 2D sense, et cetera, they give you some other different records, like the two class of, the two rank of the class group of the, right, if you write as y squared equals a cubic, that cubic field has to have a large uh, two parts of the class group, as it turns out. If you <coughs> out the proof of, uh, of uh, uh, Mordell's theorem, and that was observed uh, by I hope I spelled the name correctly, Katz, Grunt, Sherman, and Weigand in their 2016 paper proving that the rank actually equals 28. I was only able to get 28 uh, dependent generators if you assume the generator of human process. Uh, okay, I'm not going to exhibit those formulas. The coefficients of just the family are going to fill several pages. So here's a simple example. The generic curve of rank with a four torsion point looks like this. It turns out to be often a good idea to allow yourself to have non-minimal Weierstrass form. So this is much simpler than what you'd get by writing it out in short Weierstrass form y squared equals x u plus a x plus b. Um, torsion generator zero, zero. Uh, if you choose for a and b polynomials of degree at most two and four, you get a k3 surface with a four torsion point. Uh, if you work out what the, bad, what the reducible fibers are, uh, the largest possible rank for a K3 surface with four torsion is four. Here, it turns out that 163 is large enough. There is a couple of such uh, surfaces. Here is one of them. We will take A to be 
excuse me, you take A to be this, you take B to be that, and here are X coordinates of four independent sections which generate the group to get the retorsion. And again, every example we know that ties or is near, even near the record for rank with the four torsion point uh, comes from the family, and the first one I found back in 2006 for this choice of T. Again, all from K3 surfaces at this magic number 163. Uh, what do you do for genus bigger than one? Well, uh, Farting tells us, as Mordell conjectured several generations before, here for any given curve the genus, the, uh, of genus at least two, the number of rational points is finite. And then you can say, okay, vary, all of, vary the curve. How big can the number of points get? You have to fix the number field and fix the genus, otherwise the, equate, the, the problem is too easy. I can, you can give me any set of points, in, rational points in P2, and I can find a curve of high degree that passes through all of them. And so, but of course, this genus is going to get large too. Uh, Caprazza, Harris, and Mazur, yes, the same Mazur. Uh, Harris is, Joe Harris is one of my students, and Lucia Caprazza was his, uh, un, his graduate student at the time. Uh, proved that under a big structural conjecture, that number is finite. So in other words, there is a uniform bound. So this is, no, this is less of, it's still conjecture, but it, you know, it's tied to some structural, conge, structural conjecture of, of uh, uh, bombier lang instead of just being a matter of uh, almost theology, whether you believe it's bound or unbounded. Um, the Lang conjecture basically says if you have a variety of general type, then it can't have the risky then set of rational points. And using that and some various beautiful algebraic geometry tricks, they're able to show that, uh, uh, <coughs> that uh, there is an upper bound. We don't know what that upper bound is because after all, the bombier lang conjecture is ineffective. We don't have a proof of it. We certainly can't tell you where all of the rational points are uh, or where the, the exceptional sub-varieties are. And so, again, we are uh, down to record hunting. And again, we use families. So how do we get a family of genus two curves with uh, many sections? Well, the same Joe Harris already made a suggestion, start from some double plane, that is to say, double cover of P1 branched at, on some curve of even degree. And look at, curve, look at lines which meet that, which, uh, on which the defining polynomial of that curve is a square. So that means geometrically, any time it meets that curve, it's tangent to it, or at least meets it to multiplicity, to even multiplicity. When you have that, uh, it lifts to a pair of that whole line lifts to a pair of rational lines on the on the double cover, and then if you intersect any random line in P two, with that you get a pair of rational points. So as many of these lines as you find, you get that many pairs of rational points on your genus two curve. And mind you, genus two curve is always hyperelliptic. It's y squared equals sexic. So anytime, almost any time you have one rational point, you have another one by changing y to minus y. And again, the, the last tractable case of K3 surfaces. So now we have a double plane model where instead of a divisor of several intersections here, we have one of several section two. And here's a nice model of that surface, the same minus 163 surface. What is that? Well, the sextic is the union of these black contours. Yes, that's the degree six equation, and it also has room for a double point here. Uh, you have to blow up the double point to get a K3 as usual. Uh, there are 50 odd lines, the green lines, that meet it, that are tangent to three points, three points each. Some of them you can't see the tangents, they're either off the picture or they're paired in complex plane. And there's even a few of the many uh, six-fold tangent uh, conics in the plane, which you can also get from the lattice of, uh, from your own severity lattice. So just using the green lines, I get an infant family of K3, of genus two curves with about 53 pairs of rational points. Using, uh, using these uh, conics, I get it up to about 70 pairs. And then uh, searching efficiently enough, which I uh, thankfully Michael Stoll was able to uh, to implement something that I 
that didn't think, wasn't uh, brave enough to try to do, around the turn of the year 2008 to 9, we found an explicit example that has, this sex tech has 642 at least rational points, uh, of which the first few are quite simple and the last few are not. And probably these are all of them, but proving that kind of thing is very difficult. Um, this method more or less runs out of steam. The last case for which you was sort of on a par with previous records uh, for genus 3 is uh, K3 surfaces, excuse me, is uh, quartic K3 surfaces with many lines. So again, you cut such a, such a thing by a uh, plane, you get a plane quartic, which is usual, the usual form of genus 3 curve, and each, each line would meet that at a separate rational point. So as many lines as you could find, that's a lower bound or number of rational points. Uh, the largest seems to be 46. I don't have a nice picture of it, but here's a picture of, yes, that's a quartic, even though it has all of these holes in it. And it's a model of that same minus 163 surface. You can sort of see the same holes. Like anytime you had one of these real overs, that gave rise to a hole in the double cover. And here are most of the lines in it. Some of them again are out of the frame. Okay, why do we care about elliptic vibrations? Well, it's clear when I was looking for elliptic curves of high rank, but they're also used for another context. Um, they write your variety as a, union of ellipt as a family of elliptic curves. We understand elliptic curves quite well. Euler already understood elliptic curves well enough to say, well, if I have a, uh, you know, if I have a quartic surface that has some random lines in it, I get a family of degree three curves by looking at a pencil of, of uh, what do you call it, of planes through one of these lines and looking at the residual, uh, residual uh, cubic, that cubic is going to meet the plane in some other, if there's another random line, it's going to meet at some other point. Well, that line is probably trivial, like, you know, a to the fourth plus b to the fourth equals c to the fourth plus d to the fourth. You see some trivial lines where each one of these variables is plus or minus one of those. But then using the group law on this elliptic curve, or you know, the tangent and chord construction as Euler knew it, or other variations of it, he is able to construct a new non-trivial point. So that's how he handled at least two of the three surfaces that I showed you in the beginning, uh, this one and the rational box problem. Uh, <coughs> also, uh, I mentioned there was a uh, Tate Schiotta theorem that says, if you know the lattice picture, to say you know what U is, and therefore you know the complement L, you find it's, you find it's say, root lattice, all of the ADE lattices that are generated by vectors of norm two, that tells you the uh, configuration of reducible, uh, of reducible fibers, and the model V lattice, the model V group is a quotient of L by that. It could contain torsion, but there's also a canonical height that you get from the intersection pairing. It's basically a projection of the quadratic form here onto the uh, orthogonal complement of R. So that's how I was able to predict that I'm going to get rank 17 on that uh, K3 surface. Um, K3 surfaces can have lots of elliptic vibrations. We saw an example of that earlier this morning, again, in Professor Kubata's talk, when we started from this kind of elliptic surface, it's a K3 surface. You have to, as you explained, you have to scale by powers of t, and this is really at a t to the fourth, t to the seventh, sixth, and fifth. So t is one elliptic vibration, x is another. Right? So there are different choices of L, here I'm calling one of them L prime, that give rise to the same neuron severity group, and basically different choices of lattices in the same genus are going to give rise to different choices of uh, elliptic vibration. Here, the discriminant is one. It's a famous theorem. There's only two lattices of discriminant one that are even of rank 16. There's E8 squared. That's what you get from taking x as the fiber here. So x equals zero and x equals infinity give rise to the two E8 fibers. Whereas if you let t be your parameter, excuse me, this, you get t, sorry, this is what you get by taking t to be the parameter. If you take x to be the parameter, you get an elliptic surface with a two torsion point. There is one bad fiber of whatever type corresponds to D16. I think it's 112 star. The plus there means you also get a two torsion point. 
have a lattice that contains E16, and even a lattice that contains E16 with index 2. And that's the only possibilities. Uh, when the discriminant gets larger, there are more of them, and just yesterday I finished listing all of the elliptic vibrations, they say not by explicit formulas, God forbid, but I could do that for any one of them, but all of the lattices that have rank 18, right, so that's 20 minus 2, and not n, and discriminant 163, and there's this many of them. So it's not as large as these counts of 10 to the power 7 and 55 that we heard yesterday, but I have the list of all of them. And there's none of rank 0, there's none of rank bigger than 12, there's, as I mentioned, two of rank four and, four and four torsion. You can also have two torsion and three torsion, but most of them have, have trivial torsion. Um, and of course, number theorists are interested in quadratic forms also, and general quadratic forms. So that's my final excuse for being a number theorist to work with K3 surfaces. And there's a way of moving systematically between them. So uh, if you give me any, any one of these, I can, with a few, uh, so-called two neighbor steps, so that's two lattices which are almost the same up to index P, you know, P equals two. Move to one that has E7 and E8 fibers, that's also a form that was shown by Kuwata earlier, and then use Kumar's results to get the corresponding uh, genus, to, to get a corresponding genus two curve if it exists, and then use that for people who need these genus two curves for Galois representations. Okay, finally, what does all this to do with uh, elliptic vibrations of Kalabi out of the degree of dimension three or bigger. Okay, I mentioned before there's a beautiful theory of some of these elliptically fibered uh, rational, curves, rational surfaces. Here is the biggest of all of these examples. This was found by Shioda about by now 30 years ago. Uh, so suppose you impose one condition on your rational elliptic surface which has it's an additive fiber to say cusp, doesn't contribute anything to, to the neuron severity group, and you choose your coordinates so that's above t equals infinity. So that means you can write your surface in this form instead of a fourth and a sixth degree polynomial, it's a third and fifth. And the, there is not, it's not unique because you can still change t by an affine transformation, you can scale x, y, and t. So using these scalings, you can make the t to the fifth coefficient, q5, equal one, then you can try to complete the fifth power. You won't succeed, but you at least make q4 equal zero. And then you have three, uh, you, have, you have four uh, unknown coefficients, p's and q's, in each of these uh, terms of the Varshras equation, subject to only one remaining scaling. And that scaling, keeping q5 equals one, is the one that has t, x, and y of the following weights. The whole equation has weight 30, so x has weight 10, y has weight 15, t has to have weight 6, so that means you, know, you can multiply t by lambda to the 6, x by lambda to the 10, etc., p3 by lambda squared. Oh, this is a very famous sequence of numbers. These are the uh, invariant degrees, or whatever else you want to call them, for E8. And E8 is, in fact, the group of rational points. And what makes this what Shota calls an excellent family is the following. There are 240 minimal sections, so their roots, they are have uh, height pairing two of themselves. That means they can be written in form x equals some quadratic and y equals some cubic polynomial. The leading coefficients have to match, and that means that you can write the leading coefficients as a to the minus two, a to the minus three. Why minus? Well, because that way A has weight one instead of minus one. And also, one final bit of geometry, if you parameterize your uh, cusp as t squared t cubed, why do we call this additive reduction? Because the usual group law makes this an additive group. So the group law says if you take three, three points that add up to zero, that come from collinear points, lemma, three points on this are collinear if their t inverse values add up to zero. So this A is a rational chord, is an additive coordinate on that fiber. And it has weight one. And well, if you just give me the P's and Q's, you can't tell me which of the 240 roots is which, right? I mean, there's this whole huge vial group of symmetries of the eight lattice. And so all I know is what they are up to the action of the vial group, but I have these A values 
which are additive, and so you know, I have a homomorphism that I get from these A's from the Mordel Vey group to the additive group, that's what we call denote by G sub A. And well, uh, amazingly enough, these P's and Q's have to be invariant <coughs> under it, they generate the ring of invariants. So there is some universal, there is some choice of invariants generating the ring of invariants, such as if you make those P's and Q's their coefficients here, that is an elliptic surface, rational elliptic surface, whose sections are given by explicit polynomials in all of these A's, which have this property that x2 and x and x2 and y3 are the square and cube of A inverse. No, I'm just trying to get a little bit. So at the beginning, you started just a type two singular class. That's right. So if on this person's list, this is the one on the list which is just type two, right? No, the person's list is for K3. I'm in the rational elliptic surface. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. sorry. I, thought you were, I thought that was your rational elliptic surface. Yeah. It's a rational elliptic surface and with just... one person's list is a list there, right? Oh, okay. There, there must be two different person's lists. There's a rational elliptic surface list. Okay, fine. So it has... It it just has one type... List, and that has a two on but, but you're now getting E8. Is, is this like simultaneously a deformation of the E8? Yeah, that's... A, at least uh, Shioda has a way of thinking about it that way. If you kill all of the p's and q's, it's y squared equals x cubed plus t to the fifth, and that has an e8 at zero. So, so these p's are deformations away from the e8. That's correct. And there are similar <coughs> formulas for other choices of, so, uh, okay, so we care about these for number theory. Sorry, no, and, and what's the word all day, lattice? It's the e8 lattice. It is the e8 lattice. Yeah. So, so, okay, great. So it's like you had an e8, and then you're deforming away, and you still see the... If you get rid of all the p's, you have no more delta. But this is a deformation away that maintains the e8 rank in the u1, but it's lost the chip. Which has to. Yeah, great. Okay. okay, so number theorists have our own reasons for caring about such things. You know, we get, as I mentioned, rank eight, uh, lots of rank eight elliptic cores. We get nice Bauer extensions of the rational numbers. But also, remember that this is parameterized by, what was it? So we have these eight variables, the homomorphism to GA, together with the value of T, which is homogeneous of weight six. So here is a way to get an elliptic vibration of a Calabi-Yau five-fold to P4. Namely, start from this, from the eight the dimensional space of A, that's projectively self-dimensional. Take your favorite four-dimensional subspace of that. That still gives you some polynomials of those degrees. Choose T to be some polynomial of degree six, some form of degree six in that. And now I have, now this formula here, each, uh, each P and each Q is a homogeneous polynomial of the corresponding degree. T is one of degree six. So I get homogeneous polynomials of degree 20 and 30. And the degree and the A dimensional, the rank eight uh, Model V group still survives this. So I get a whole family of Calabi Yau five folds. You know, presumably there's some there's some small dimensional singular locus that has to be uh, resolved, but I get that with a uh, with an E8 uh, of Model V. And likewise, there are some other uh, excellent families. So, for example, this year the E7 family, since I am running out of time by now, I will just show that the, you know, the, the, the numerology works out right. The, the weights are, in fact, what they are for the uh, E7 invariant degrees. And you can get a rank 7 elliptic vibration of the Calabi out 3 4. Unfortunately, I'm a bit too late to impress anybody with the rank 7 vibration, because you guys apparently know uh, some way of getting rank 8. But at a, a bit after Shioda, so about 10 years afterwards, I found that there are elliptic K3s that give the same kind of special structure, excellent families, if you require them to have this special form where you only have every third coefficient so that you have an action that multiplies x and y by opposite x and t, I'm sorry. Why is it y is fixed? This should be t and x goes to wt omega t omega squared x. It's, it fixes the holomorphic form. 
I have to fix this before sending this into be a broadcast. Um, and okay, in general, a cage resurface, you can't predict the Mordell Vey, you can't just you know, say it always has the same Mordell Vey group because there is this H to zero obstruction, but the action of omega splits it into isotopic components. The invariant part gives you, again, a rational uh, surface, but there are these other two components that have zero, six, zero, there is no zero, I mean, there, there is no H to zero, so all of these have to come from, uh, from the uh, neuron severity lattice and therefore from the Mordell Vey group. The Mordell Vey group turns out to be the famous 12 dimensional Coxeter Todd lattice. It has discriminant 3 to the 6, it has minimal, four, uh, it has minimal uh, norm 4, and it has this many minimal uh, vectors. So that's 756 is like the 240 for E8. <coughs> the, dimension, the dimension neurology for the family works out right. And again, if you impose an additive fiber at infinity, set the leading coefficient Q12 to 0, you can normalize to get T to 7, and you get one of these excellent families. And now instead of the Weyer group of E8, there is something that's trying to be a Weyer group the Comster Todd lattice. It's a complex reflection group, and it's a classic theorem by now. The Chevalier Shepard Todd theorem that every subgroup of the finite subgroup of UN generated by reflections, let's say transformations that preserve a co dimension one subspace, has again a polynomial invariant ring. And there is a complete classification of those of the, well, of the irreducible ones. And here, these numbers 6, 12, 18, 24, 30, 42 are in fact the invariant degrees for. For Shepard Todd 34. And well, this is nice for number theory. I don't, I think 42 is just a bit large for me to get any Calabi alpha vibrations out of this, it would have rank 12. But again, I can go down one degree by setting the t to the seventh coefficient to be zero as well. And now I get this family. Now it's a five dimensional reflection group, Shepard Todd, this number, and the relevant degree here is 18. So I have a bunch of those parameterized now by a five-dimensional space, so P4. And 18 is the right degree such that if I specialize to a, uh, if I special, so I've, I've known this about this for almost 20 years now, but two years ago, uh, Wadi they told me about, you know, this question of finding, uh, you know, reasonably large ranks for, uh, were there vague groups of Calabi-Aus of degree three, of dimension three and higher, and they realize that I can get one of these by the same mechanism of uh, starting from that, restricting to a random P2, and then letting T be a quadratic form on that, and then this equation gives you a calabi with the same 10 sections. What's more, if you had chosen your t to be the zero form, right, if you choose, if, if you, you know, you can think about this as a deformation of y squared equals x cubed plus t to the ninth, whatever that means, but it's also, you can set t to be zero, and then all you have is y squared equals x cubed plus q naught, and so that's a very special kind of elliptic surface, it's uh, of elliptic k3, but it still moves in a positive dimensional family, and still has these uh, still has these 10 independent sections of Mordell Vey, now with an action of the, the, of the same tree cycle. So that's all I have. I'm sorry I'm a bit over my allotted 45 minutes, so maybe now's a good time to ask for the last question before the next talk. Can you analyze also the current dimension trend that was like? Can I analyze it and call the mention two low side? Uh, now I go back to uh, my excuse that I'm not even an algebraic geometer. I'd be happy if somebody here can work out where all this fits in the you know H21, et cetera, picture. So a related question. Can you write down explicitly the sections? Yes. Uh, all of these so are you write the large cross model and you can write the sections. Yeah, just as was the case for the original uh, you know, the E87, et cetera, family. So the convention two singularity should be released. Should be
be able to read off the charges. Hmm? You should be able to read off the charges knowing the intersection. But he says by rationing, there will be uh, What? It's y, it's, it's y squared equals x cubed plus the degree 12 times x plus degree 18, uh, which has all of these 10, which has these 10 sections. Um, I guess you're going to, to say that I, I don't, that I still need to somehow uh, resolve whatever singularities appear there. I don't know if there's, you know, conceivably there would, there could be some strange obstruction to doing that all and still keeping the 10 sections. Is that even possible? No, 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 the, the sections you keep, they were asking like what happened in combination two. Uh, uh -huh. yeah. I mean, some of those are the singularities that have the matter in them. That's right, that's right. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Right. So you have to check them, right? You can't mm -hmm. say it by the nose, right? It's not the And the constraints on the Q, they're just, they're just fixed. On Q? The Qs. The B's and Q's are, for our, are, are universal polynomials, are universal uh, homogeneous polynomials in the coefficient, in the, in the variables of that P4, and therefore in the P2. So when you say universal, you mean not arbitrary? There are some explicit polynomials which generate invariant ring of five variables. I, I choose a three dimensional subspace of that five dimensional space as equivalent to choosing a P2 out of the P4, and then I evaluate on that subspace. But so you, you have actually a formula for P1, P4, some specific... That's right, yeah. According. That's right. Yeah. That's a very good try. Okay. With the degrees that are given here. Yeah. Okay. So we I have the formula as, you know, take these invariants for, you know, take these symmetric functions of the cubes and then put, plug them in here, otherwise this would be some huge... Yeah, I have thought. Perhaps we can defer other questions to Coffee. Okay, can we thank the speaker again?